this ISC webinar that is going to uh, feature Helen Berman today. It's a great, immense pleasure for, for me to introduce Helen. Uh, a little bit about Helen and uh, the history of free data access and data sharing to which Helen has greatly contributed and is the reason why she is speaking to us today. Helen received her undergraduate degree from Barnard College in New York City and earned her PhD in, the crystallogra in crystallography from the University of Pittsburgh. She then joined the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, where she further developed her research activities in crystallography of biological molecules and became a senior member of the center and an active member of the scientific community. After 20 years at Fox Chase, uh, Dr. Berman moved to Rutgers uh, State University of New Jersey, where she took up the position of Board of Governors, Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, and is now a Professor Emerita. While at Rutgers, her work focused on nucleic acids and their interactions with proteins and on the structure of collagen. In 1971, Helen played a key role in the creation of the protein data bank, the PDB, at Brookhaven National Labs in New York. And this was also the time when I first met Helen. And in 1992, she co-founded the Nucleic Acid Database uh, to collect and disseminate information on nucleic acid structures. In 1998, Helen Berman and Phil Byrne at UCSD took the responsibility of directing the PDB and created the Research Collaboratory for Structural Bioinformatics, which was later integrated into the Worldwide Protein Data Bank, WWPDB, which is a partnership between the RCSB, the PDBE in Europe, and the PDBJ in Japan. Dr. Berman has also otherwise been very active in the scientific community serving as president of the American Crystallographic Association in 1988 and advising both the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. Dr. has been given numerous awards, too many to cite here, cite all of them today. But her role in the creation of the PDB in 1971 stands out. It's important to realize that this was many years before the idea of using data, or for that matter, big data, as a source for extracting knowledge came ago. We would be nowhere. Vaccine design would be nowhere. Protein engineering, protein design, and protein structure prediction would be nowhere. And drug would be set back. So let's listen to Helen's story on founding the PDB and sustaining it into the 21st century and learn from her experience on how difficult issues of data sharing and access can be successfully approached by bringing the community together. Helen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Shoshana. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, let me get my slides on. Okay, <clears throat> so I, um, I'm going to tell you about the evolution of data sharing culture in structural biology, and I think that that is a very important way of stating it. Um, as you all know, we are in the midst of a revolution in structural biology. This is a slide that I uh, got from Andre Sali, uh, starting at the very beginning with the structure of uh, DNA, uh, through the uh, early structures of proteins such as myoglobin to where we are now with the gorgeous integrative structures of a nuclear pore protein uh, uh, system and then uh, the idea of actually being able to model uh, in structural sense the uh, a cell. So where did this all begin and how did this happen? Uh, we have to first start with the early days of structural biology. Uh, and J.D. Bernal was a pioneer in structural biology back in the 1930s at Cambridge. And with Dorothy Hodgkin, 
produced the very first X-ray diffraction picture of a protein in 1934. Um, about 20 years later, 22 years later, Kendrew uh, determined the structure of myoglobin, followed very shortly after that by perutes with the structure of hemoglobin. Um, so though that was though these were this is setting the scene for the structural biology, which of course is key to all of this. And here are some pictures of the very first protein structures shown in different representations. Uh, so we have the structure of lysozyme. This particular picture was actually uh, hand drawn by Irving Geis, a great molecular artist. And then the very first uh, structure of an American, first American uh, crystal structure that was ribonuclease done in the Cartha lab and in Fred Richards lab. Um, so we have the structures um, and then at the same time, the studies of protein folding in vitro, most notably um, by Chris Anfinson, um, who um, uh, made us aware that the protein sequence determines the structure and how that happens and why that happens uh, was not and is still not uh, known. But we know if we denature and renature a protein, it has the same exact shape. The other very important influence here was that of Cyrus Leventhal, uh, who was a uh, who did the structure, who who was very focused on protein folding in silico, uh, and actually um, was uh, Shoshana's uh, PhD advisor. This is a picture of him from Michigan. He was then at MIT and then Columbia. And uh, at the same time as he was studying protein folding, a postdoc of his, Edgar Meyer, was at uh, MIT uh, trying to utilize um, computers to visualize proteins. Again, this is in the 1960s when this was a, a very, very uh, forward-looking way of looking at uh, proteins. And then finally, um, the idea of data archiving itself uh, uh, we were very influenced by the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center that was headed up by Alga Kanad in Cambridge, uh, and where she assembled uh, all the structures of small molecules into a data bank. There was also a lot of community activism at that point uh, by people who were very uh, watching from the sidelines what was going on in protein crystallography and realizing that there needed to be a way that the data could be shared. And most notably Edgar Meyer, Gerson Cohn, who was at NIH as a postdoc at the time and myself. And we had all kinds of meetings and uh, exchanges via snail mail and uh, produced a petition shown on the right uh, in 1971, if you look, you can see uh, Shoshana is the fourth signatory in this petition. This petition was given to the American Crystallographic Association, who then took a very active and supportive role uh, in, in what we were trying to do. But please remember, at the time we were doing it, there were maybe, two hand, uh, maybe a handful or two handfuls of crystal structures. Um, in 1971, there was a very important meeting at Cold Spring Harbor uh, that we all attended uh, and where we got to hear the real greats in protein crystallography uh, talk about their exciting results. And after one of the sessions in the evening, there uh, was the bar and several of us uh, were there. And at that bar was Walter Hamilton shown here on the lower uh, left and Walter was a uh, was a small molecule crystallographer at Brookhaven and was working on neutron structures of amino acids. And uh, Edgar uh, was spending his summer uh, at Brookhaven Lab trying to figure out how to assemble uh, these proteins into a library. And so we talked to Walter and we said we really need to have a protein data bank. And he said done, we will have a protein data bank. Uh, 
he set the PDB up at Brookhaven. He uh, flew over to England and set up a collaboration with Alga Kennard uh, at the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. Edgar uh, set up the technology for doing all of this. And I, uh, at the time, became an annotator, which meant that I was typing coordinates in on punch cards at Brookhaven. <laughs> the, uh, we then, uh, one of the issues when you're setting up this kind of thing is how do you actually set policies? So the PDB was uh, sort of a voluntary effort. Uh, I don't think that many people paid much attention to what we were doing uh, with the PDB. But a few people were paying attention, uh, most notably Fred Richards at Yale uh, and Richard Dickerson uh, at Caltech and then UCLA, um, who said that it was not right that these data are not publicly available for everyone um, and that people who determined structures um, had a, a moral duty to put those structures in the PDB. Fred Richards, who was uh, in many ways a quite a conservative person, uh, uh, also created a petition and he got some of the real greats in protein crystallography to sign this petition saying that um, the uh, structures should be uh, mandatory, they, they should be deposited in the PDB as a condition of publication. Um, you can't just sort of rule on high and say this has to happen. What's really important and one of the lessons we learned with the PDB is you always have to bring in the community and get their input. And in this case, there were several um, uh, committees formed to figure out what you actually mean by putting the data in the PDB. You know, what, what data should be put in? Uh, what format should it be in? What is the procedure? The most important of those committees was the IUCR Commission on Biological Macromolecules. Uh, that committee met for seven years and hashed out exactly what should happen and produced on the right an article which laid this all out. Um, and this article and these guidelines formed the basis for mandatory uh, deposition of structures in the PDB. Once this once these guidelines were set up, and remember they were produced by the people who were producing the data, um, the journals began to come on board slowly but surely. Not surprisingly, the first was one of the uh, IUCR active journals, but then JBC uh, followed very shortly thereafter. And at this point, there's no journal, every journal um, uh, requires deposition of coordinates. And of course the funding agencies then came in and um, also uh, insisted that these uh, coordinates should be in the PDB. The other issue was the issue of data standards. Uh, the only format that existed, uh, uh, well, the very, very first format for the PDB was called the diamond format, but uh, in, very shortly after that was used, we began using what was called the PDB format which was an implicit format. It was based on the punch cards, 80 columns, and it had lots of limitations. Um, and we wanted to have a, a format that was explicit where you knew exactly what was in the file. And a, a committee was formed by the IUCR to um, explore how to do this. And the committee was headed up by F Paula Fitzgerald, shown in the center here. Um, the architect of that format was at the time a graduate student named John Westbrook. Uh, Phil Bourne was uh, involved. Uh, Sid Hall was the original uh, creator of SIF for small molecules. And here's Shoshana uh, at a meeting that she convened uh, in Brussels where we hashed out what had to happen. And uh, we don't have time here to talk about how dramatic that meeting uh, really uh, was, <laughs> but uh, we we managed to come up with an agreement as to what the format should be like. Uh, 
So at first it was only for x-ray. Uh, there were about 3,000 definitions for every single aspect of the experiment and the um, uh, results. Uh, and then in time, as new methods came in, extensions were made for NMR and 3D uh, and, and electron microscopy. Now, um, this is all well and good, but again, you have to have some kind of uh, all the stakeholders have to be on board. And the, in this case, one of the most important stakeholders were the software developers of the refinement programs and visualization programs that people used for structure. So uh, we, what we realized was that if they uh, adopted MMSIF, then what the structures were being refined would be in the right format. They'd go into the PDB, no problem. Uh, we had a meeting in 2011 at EBI, and again, lots of drama. Uh, we, we hashed it all out and agreed that MMSIF, now called PDBX because it included uh, NMR and, and EM, would be the master format for the PDB. And that was decided in 2011, and I think it was another three or four years, I can't remember, uh, that it was finally made official that that would be the format. Uh, the other issue that Walter realized um, when he uh, flew over to England in 1971 is that the PDB is a, a global effort. It is not um, uh, an American uh, product, and he knew that, and uh, we all knew that. But there were no, uh, there was no official organization. So in 2003, we established something called the Worldwide PDB and that consisted of EBI, PDBJ, and um, at, the, at the time, and then later BMRB for NMR. Um, and the, the key there was that the data, we wanted to make sure the data would be freely and globally available, and that we would um, collaborate on all aspects of data processing and annotation. So no matter who processed the data, it would wind up uh, be looking the same and being the same. We did say that in order to encourage um, good, healthy competition, every site could have a different website, but the master archive would would be the same no matter where you got the data. And we set up an advisory, a global worldwide uh, advisory committee to help us figure out what to do. And here's a picture of one of the earlier meetings of the um, worldwide PDB. Um, the other issue was the experimental data. The PDB, uh, it was um, only um, voluntary to put in the uh, experimental data into a PDB file, but many people quite correctly said that how can you really check the data properly if the structure factors aren't there? And so, um, uh, in 2008, it was announced that the experimental data would um, be required for depositions, first structure factors, and then um, uh, chemical shifts for um, NMR. Um, so that's where we were in 2008. But the other issue, as I mentioned, was the other structure determination methods. At the beginning, it was only uh, x-ray but there were other methods that were being used and we needed to deal with that. Um, the NMR issue was handled fairly efficiently. Cryoelectron microscopy was much more complicated and we needed to be able to handle those data. And here are some examples of what the uh, uh, structures that we were dealing with looked like. Um, and what you see here is that the growth in electron microscopy uh, data is very uh, large and it, we, it's being predicted now that by 2030, uh, EM will surpass X-ray as the method for structure determination. So uh, we again formed a, a collaboration uh, in, this, in this case with uh, EMDB um, and the RCSB PDB, which is the American Data Center, uh, and then a group in, um, at the time, 
uh, a group in Texas headed up by Wachu, and we formed something called the EM Data Resource. At the beginning, this was actually to help collect the data. Now all the data are collected um, in one way uh, by the PDB through something called uh, OneDeb. But before we had that, we used this as a way of collecting uh, the data and then getting it into the PDB. Um, the other big challenge was integrative structure determination, where you use multiple methods to determine the structures of uh, large macromolecular, big complexes. And uh, there, the PDB until recently, the only structures uh, that were in there were determined by single methods, either by X-ray, by NMR, or EM. But more and more structures were being determined using multiple methods. And we needed to find out a way to, um, to archive those data. So in order to do that, we did what we often do. <clears throat> we set up a task force. And here's a picture of a meeting that we held uh, in 2014. And that meeting was quite extraordinary. We had that at the EBI and we brought together the exper main experimental methods, um, EM, X-ray, NMR, but also FRET, small angle scattering. We brought together computational biologists. We brought together people who were doing integrative modeling, uh, most especially Andre Solly, um, uh, Alexander Bonvin. We, we wanted to make sure we brought in as many people as we could to figure out what to do with these integrative uh, uh, structures. Um, we set up some subgroups, one having to do with um, the different methods and coming up with a way to create a network of model and data repositories. Uh, and I show here the, the initial stakeholders, uh, which actually surprisingly, uh, it seemed like not possible that there would be uh, so much activity, but there in fact is in these different areas. And then another subgroup uh, having to do with validation and Andre Sali and Torsten Schwed were in charge of that. Here's an early model <clears throat> for how we would have this federation. So the models uh, of the structures would be um, in some interconnected way uh, in the center here. And then all the different databases for the different areas that either were established or would be established would be able to operate independently, but feed the, uh, the um, restraint data into the PDB. And we, in that way, would be uh, working together. Uh, we created, got funded, and got created, uh, and created something called PDB Dev. PDB Dev is a, a, a development platform that allowed us to figure out how to collect all this information in a way that would be useful for the PDB. Um, and uh, uh, it was a, a collaboration uh, between uh, Andre Sali and, and my group, and now is uh, headed up uh, by Andre and Brenda uh, Vallat, who uh, was in my group and now is in charge of uh, this project. And uh, uh, together we figured out how to uh, archive these structures. And now in the next two or three years, the idea is to uh, bring this all together uh, into the PDB and the dev will go away and the PDB will be able to handle these kinds of structures. So I think I just showed you uh, just how important community is. You can't have a PDB that operates kind of as its own Lone Ranger uh, and, and not bring in the experts. So in each case, uh, when we needed to figure out how to validate these structures, how to handle it, we formed these task forces. And we have the first one was the X-ray task force and then NMR, EM, small angle, and now integrative. And those task forces continue to, well, the memberships have changed and have evolved. But in each case, 
uh, experts in the particular areas would come together to figure out how to handle these structures. And so the community gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, which we think is the way it needs to be uh, in order to um, uh, get the expertise necessary to do this job uh, correctly. And in each case, a white paper is produced which states what's going to happen and what should happen. The PDB then takes that white paper and tries to implement all of the recommendations into the validation code. It's a very long process. You have to be very patient, but it ensures that what's going in has um, wide, you know, widespread agreement. Um, so what I think I'm, what I'm hoping you've gotten out of what I've said so far is how there has to be synergy um, uh, in three areas. They, you have to have the science which continues to evolve, starting from very small proteins in the, uh, in the 1970s to uh, this, I, I have not extended this picture, but in the 2010s, we have macromolecular machines. Uh, the technology um, also keeps changing for producing these structures. Uh, in the early days, we had punch cards. Uh, we, the people were building their models uh, by hand with brass rods. The data were taken one diffraction point at a time. Uh, then we had the revolution with synchrotron radiation, uh, computer graphics, we brought in NMR. Then we have electron microscopy, really fast computers, fast detectors. In the 2000s, we had high throughput structural genomics, which introduced robots into the um, uh, structure, uh, into the uh, uh, structure determination process, starting from a protein uh, crystallization. And then we have integrative methods. And then on the, on the lower uh, panel, Again, how community was involved in every step of the way. They were involved in the young, the young folks uh, uh, trying to convince uh, our elders that there has to be a PTB. Uh, there were the deposition guidelines, and uh, I, I highlight here Fred Richards, the standardization, um, the change of uh, venue of the PDB from Brookhaven to RCSB, the recognition of a global community, official recognition, it was always recognized, uh, and forming the WWPDB, and then now um, the uh, constant attention on validation standards and making sure that the structures are in fact correct. Um, so where are we? Uh, right now, the PDB has a over 175,000 structures. Uh, in 2020, there were 15,000 new depositions. That's just remarkable when I think that in 1998, when the PDB moved from Brookhaven uh, to RCSB, there were a total of 9,000 structures in the whole PDB, and now there are more than 10,000 a year being deposited. Uh, there are many different methods now used for structure determination, and we need to work with those different methods. The users uh, are, and we we are able to, by surveys and other methods, uh, figure out who they are. So they're industrial and academic scientists, teachers, students, and the general public. And, and uh, I think that is also quite remarkable. The number right now is that there are 2.4 million coordinate data files downloaded every day from the PDB. Uh, that's a lot of data. Uh, um, we have uh, some companies will download the whole PDB um, uh, maybe once a week or once a month, depending on the company. And then individual users are, are downloading. So people are using the data very heavily. Um, this is another way of showing the growth of the PDB. Um, and what you can see is NMR is growing really, really, sorry, EM is growing really, really fast. So what has data sharing enabled? 
for the depositors, in, in other words, for people to want to do this or to cooperate, um, there has to be something in it for everybody. So for the depositors, it's the pre the first thing was the prevention of uh, data loss. Uh, I think mo many of you will uh, think about how when a graduate student leaves, uh, you've got to make sure that the data are somewhere. And if you think about uh, what that could mean if the data were lost. And we have, in fact, had some interesting stories about data that luckily didn't get lost because it's in the PDB. Uh, it also uh, enables efficient structure uh, determination because uh, all those structures within the PDB can then be used to determine new structures by a method called molecular replacement. Uh, also very important in map fitting. Um, so the structure determination gains. And then the thing that uh, originally people didn't like, the idea of validation, now of course, uh, is very important. And people know that if they submit data to the PDB, uh, the data are checked in so many different ways. And so uh, they're going to have higher quality structures. Uh, and uh, that is also very important. And then all of those structures in the PDB and all the different kinds of testing that are done enables the development of new testing methods. Um, for the users, the entire field of structural bioinformatics exists because um, the PDB is there. And among the many things that can happen uh, because of the PDB is efficient classification of structures, comparison of structures, and all different kinds of analyses. Um, there are several uh, new knowledge bases out there which take subsets of PDB data um, and use that um, to understand, say, for example, membrane proteins or nucleic acids. Of course, uh, it is key for drug discovery and for protein design. And finally, I don't have to tell this audience the importance of structure prediction. Uh, we have CASP for the uh, stru protein structure prediction and CAPRI for uh, understanding interactions. And then the um, uh, work by DeepMind and AlphaFold um, to actually uh, be able to very efficiently uh, predict structure, uh, protein structure. Uh, I think there's a lot more uh, that is going to happen in this area, but I think that the trajectory is very, very uh, clear. Um, so now let's talk about a real live um, uh, situation having to do with the public health. Um, in 1982, when the uh, AIDS epidemic uh, became to, uh, apparent, um, there were many people who felt that the structures in, uh, that the PDB had had to be public. And that was part of the, um, uh, not public, but, but, but deposition had to be mandatory. And that was part of the reasoning for uh, making uh, a deposition uh, mandatory. But during that period, people did voluntarily make their structures available, which were key to developing the drugs for um, HIV, which now has made HIV uh, a, a chronic illness rather than a killer disease uh, leading to AIDS. And so, uh, uh, we knew that, and the PDB played a very strong role back then. Now, uh, all the structures are in the PDB, uh, and I'd just like to point some things out. The first structure related to AIDS, uh, sorry, related to COVID, uh, was deposited in January 2020. Um, there are both uh, X-ray and 3DEM uh, COVID-related structures, and they represent 11% of the structures in the PD. Um, so uh, there's now more than 1,200 structures related to COVID in the PDB. The biocuration of the structures 
was prioritized all, over all other structures when the pandemic was obvious. And so very early on, um, the depositors were strongly encouraged to release their structures immediately prior to publication, which they did. There was also very careful curation to make sure that the taxonomy name and the Unipro referencing was absolutely correct since we didn't want to make do anything that was going to cause a problem. Um, so what I'm showing here is that um, the COVID, uh, because the PDB was set up the way the PDB is set up, it was ready when there was a, a medical uh, a disaster, a public health disaster, and the PDB was there to help in, in, in all that needed to be done in order to respond to this uh, dreadful disease. So let's go back to how did this all happen and what are what what do I see as the key here? The most one of the most important people uh, that we have to pay tribute to here is J. D. Bernal, because it wasn't just that he was a very good crystallographer. He was a key influence on the culture of structural biology and wrote a book called The Social Function of Science, um, and co which covers the organization of research to science and its social role. And there's a statement in there that science is communism, um, meaning that we really all need to work together and we have to know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so he, he pervaded the culture of the of, of crystallography and uh, the the structural community was always aware of these uh, communal activities and and the, the need to cooperate and collaborate. The other person um, who I will tell you that I did not I did not follow this work at all. But when I gave a seminar once a while ago, uh, somebody pointed out that we were following the principles of Eleanor Ostrom, who won Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 2009, in which she said that bottom-up collective action could work better than top-down enforcement, and that groups define, devise clear rules. What actions are and are not allowed must be based on local conditions and knowledge, adaptable to changing circumstances and include organized monitoring and enforcement. And all of this was explained to me by a neighbor of mine in Princeton named Avi Dixit, who was a friend of, of uh, Eleanor Ostrom's and was um, uh, d does game theory and explained all of this. And one of the warnings he gave me is he said, don't get too big. So that actually is one of the reasons why this federated model is a more uh, is a more realistic model than having one gigantic uh, database. Uh, and then finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the people who are really running the PDB now, the RCSB PDB, now headed up by Stephen Burley, who was. Uh, the person who came on after me, uh, PDBE, uh, headed up by uh, Samir Valenkar, PDBJ, headed up by Genji Kirisu. Um, there's a, a grant uh, for PDB Dev that is being done by Brinda Vellet and Andre Sali, and uh, for EMDR, Wachu and uh, Kathy Lawson, and of course, the uh, NMR group. Uh, headed up by Jeff Hoke. Uh, so pretty much everybody in the PDB now uh, is um, uh, different from when we all began, but we've been able to evolve and work together uh, and uh, keep the PDB strong. And so I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Helen. That was really a wonderful overview. And as, as you were going along, I had all these questions and you answered them one by one by one. <laughs> I was thinking about it and it was exactly what, you know, what was interesting to hear the quick reaction and the, 
the, the the system that was put in place, you know, to cater quickly, nimbly for for what was needed. And uh, the messages of don't get too big, cooperate and do <laughs> communism, science is communism, probably not something that, that, that well, the West would like. I could say it this year, I couldn't good say it year. last year. <laughs> <laughs> you can say this year, yes. So, Helen, what can you say in general about, you know, the lessons that you learned, you know, for other aspects, for example, for sharing, information on sequences, for example, for COVID-19 or, or other other important uh, uh, viral, you know, epidemics or, you know, how, how, how can you, you know, can, can you see some parallels? Well, I mean, I think that you kind of always have to keep your ear to the ground. And if you have an instinct that something is about to happen or could happen, you have to follow that instinct. And somebody once told me, um whoops i just lost shoshana um yeah there's again. somebody uh once told me that uh intuition is an integration of all of your experiences and so there is some uh, use for older people like me uh in the sense that you know you you remember oh i remember this let's do it this way. And I think you have to listen to people. You have to listen to what they want, even if you don't agree. I mean, that's really mm -hmm. important. And you have to be mm -hmm. very, um, you have to be very sensitive to all the different points of view, because just because you believe that something should be done a certain way, doesn't mean that that's the way it should be done. So you have to get really patient. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay, there are questions here now, interesting questions here. Uh, one is by Peter Koch. As someone who has spent time fighting with malformed PDB files and plenty of other loosely defined formats in bioinformatics, it was... ...the form. I, I couldn't hear that what you said. So is this this the comment? I only so heard about you fighting hear? with the format. I agree. Yes, go on. Okay, so someone was kind of congratulating <laughs> the the uh, uh, the achievement that he says it was great to see structure validation eventually being embraced and becoming yes. the norm, and, and he had experience previous experience with bed formats and, and right. things of that type. So I think this is kind of a, a, a nice comment that uh, is for, for the PDB and for the achievement. Any other questions? Yeah, I had another one. In terms of the funding model of such, you know, such a big international, international activity, remember, you know, we try to get different organisms you know co-funding you know uh, multiple you know multiple centers from different countries is this still a big problem it's an enormous problem the funding model is terrible uh because everybody has to get i don't know how many grants are funding the pdb these days you know in terms of internationally but certainly more, at one point there were 16, maybe there are 10 now different grants. And actually by having a WWPDB, you know, if one group somehow runs into trouble, at least there's some backup by the other groups. And since we're all using the same methodologies to process the data, uh, the data are not in danger. But it seems to me that it is a responsibility of the funding agencies internationally to uh, figure out how to fund um, in some sensible way. And this is infrastructure funding. Um, uh, I think there's, I mean, I, I, I've been involved in many different committees trying to figure out how exactly the funding should be. And we, there are several models. The model that we have is the worst possible model, but it's all we can do. 
In terms of the technology, in terms of the technology that can handle, for example, big federated, you know, studies or, or big downloads and uploads, especially downloads, what kind of measures have you been taking to so, allow that? So there's a lot of uh, monitoring of what's going on. And sometimes there'll be a runaway something that happens where somebody is downloading more than can be sustained. Um, and so there needs to be a, a, a message to them. In general, the PDB runs trying to make it so that everybody can have everything. But if, if some one procedure is causing a problem, it does have to be uh, slowed down so that the rest of the world can get at the data. But that's under discussion all the time. So it's no decision is made about that unilaterally and people, when we see a new kind of methodology being used for downloading and it looks like it's causing problem, there has to be discussion with, with the group as to what they're doing. And yeah, there was one the example. Data, the data is, is really, you know, very voluminous. So it's even much more that's than right. sequencing. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. So that's monitored. Everything is monitored. So in terms, all yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, so when my you begin to see something okay. happening, you say, is this just a mistake or is this telling us that we have to start coming up with a new procedure? And then you have to deal with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that, when, it, when, when you need to come up with a new procedure, it may take a while. Before right, and so you do something it. as a stopgap until you can figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but the idea is not to just sort of, you know, say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Go away. You just can't do that. At least mm -hmm. the culture, remember the, the word I'm using yeah. is culture, a certain culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you exactly go about involving the community the way you did it, like practically? When, you know, you have a problem that you need to solve, you know, you contact some experts, you know, in the area and ask them to be advisors or how do you propagate this into the, down into yeah, the community? Yeah, so, how, I mean, I can only about? tell you, I, you know, I'm no longer in charge of anything, but um, when I was in charge, uh, I remember, I think I, it's okay for me to say this, I, I remember when a very, very well-established um, structural biologist uh, had a very important structure and she she called me and she said I was told that you can't possibly process this structure and I got so annoyed by that I said of course we can I had no idea how we were going to do it but I went back to the group and I said okay we got to figure out how to do this and this was an integrative structure and we did figure out how to do it. And that's actually part of the rationale for saying, okay, we, we can't just have this as a one-off. We have to come up with a method for the whole thing. So you you do stopgap until you, you do a stopgap until you can come up with a, a proper solution. So it's an attitude issue, you know, the attitude. So is you also have a way of communicating directly to the, to the head of, you know, of, of, of your, uh, yeah, and I I know that I got uh, I got uh, emails and phone calls quite a bit, and I'm I'm assuming that the others get the same. And depending on how you feel about this stuff, my attitude was okay. This is, you know, this new science. We have to figure out how to handle it. And you try to do it ahead of time. You try to. You know, you try to get like one example, and if that one example, then and then you see whether or not that one example is going to generalize or not. And you have to have a little bit of understanding of the science, or a lot of understanding, to see whether that's going to happen. Or we'll see if you can make a good guess. And you organized conferences also in which you involved, you know, the, the stakeholders. The stakeholders are very deeply involved. There's always at least one or two meetings a year of some sort that involve people who are not themselves actually uh, determining mm -hmm. structures or, or you know, in, in the traditional areas. Okay. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> I think there are no more other questions. And I think this was exactly to the point of, of 
what is up on, on our agenda for the discussion about data sharing, you know, at the COVID-19 uh, uh, debate and, and, and session at the ISMB uh, this summer. And I think this, yeah, I what, think what this COVID thing is that very, very useful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We do actually have one question. Um, yeah, go ahead. So um, it is from a trainee uh, at SGC in, on, in uh, Toronto. Ah, so uh, they're yes, wondering. I see. I see uh, okay. uh, okay. They're wondering where do you think the next generation of structural biologists can tr can contribute the most? I guess uh, I, I would say it, it's going to be uh, the integrative modeling is going to be really important. And then there's this sort of right at the edge now is the idea of, and I'm involved in one of those projects where the idea is to model whole cells. So to create a, the whole cell, yeah. a, 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 a structural model of the whole cell, that's, that's a dream and a challenge, but ultimately that's what we're going to have to be able to do. Yeah. So we're going to have to do some cell it's biology. From Toronto. We're going to have to learn. The genomics was in Toronto. <laughs> Very nice. So prepare yourself <laughs> for that.